The woods are silent, except for the sound of their footsteps. He's taken her away from her place of safety now, as trees close behind them and light no longer breaks through the leaves. It's suddenly dark and scary. He senses her tension and reassures her. There's nothing to worry about. Everything is fine. That could not be further from the truth. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 143, The Murder of Janita Josephs. Now, it's time for my monthly tip about the latest series to watch on CBS Justice, the home of true crime on TV. And from Saturday the 27th of January, the channel will exclusively premiere season one of Three Days to Live. In cases of abduction, the first 72 hours are crucial. And through gripping reenactments, this brand new series gives viewers a glimpse into this decisive three-day period when every second counts. You can watch Three Days to Live on Saturdays and Sundays at 8 p.m. from the 27th of January until the 18th of February, only on DSTV, Channel 170, and Starsat 222. And a huge thank you to CBS Justice for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming. And for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Zoe Swart, Shanae Alves, Tanya Crick, and Nastasia Zili for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout out on the pod, and other exclusive contents, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. Cases involving children are extremely difficult for both the listener and for me. And I know not everyone can listen to these episodes, so I'm telling you up front that this case does involve the rape and murder of a seven-year-old child. It is horrific. But Janita deserves for her voice to be heard. If such episodes are too difficult for you to listen to, though, I fully understand and you should click away now and come back next week. If you are able to listen, please do so with caution, and always take care of your own emotional health first. Yes, we want to bear witness, even if that is all we can do now for the victim. But that doesn't mean overloading yourself with triggering emotions that may harm your ability to bear witness in future. In researching this case, I used the judgments and sentencing documents from the trial, as well as two media articles that were published about the case. So let's get into episode 143, The Murder of Janita Josephs. 
The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Sir Lowry's Pass is a mountain pass on the N2 National Road in the Western Cape province of South Africa. It crosses a mountain range between Somerset West and the Elgin Valley. The original version of the pass is first recorded as having been used in 1664, and by 1821, 4,500 ox wagons per year were using the pass to press people further into the Western Cape and access what was believed to be fertile farmland, occupied at that time by the indigenous people of that area, the Khoi. The scars left in the mountains by those ox wagons are still visible today, and in 1958 they were declared a national monument. Near the base of this pass, about 60 kilometres from Cape Town, is a little town called Sir Lowry's Pass Village. The village started as a single post office in 1846, which served the general area, as it was based on the railway line that still runs through there. A village slowly began to grow around the post office as people saw opportunity to sell the abundance of wild flowers that grew on the surrounding mountains to those using the railway and stopping at the post office. And soon, Sir Lowry's Pass Village was born. Over the years, the nature of the community has changed, with many of the wealthier residents moving into the picturesque wine farms on the mountain slopes surrounding the village. Now, Sir Lowry's Pass Village is predominantly home to the working class people of the area, many who work on the farms in season and others who struggle day to day doing piecework or making finding employment their daily task. The village population in 2011 was just 8,946 people, and it's likely not much different today. It's a pretty centrally located place to live, just 13 minutes' drive from Somerset West, and as such, many people can still live there and work in the surrounding towns if they're lucky enough to find employment. In 2009, the village counted among its residents Caroline Josephs and her seven-year-old daughter, Janita. Janita was born on the 1st of May 2002. She and her mom, Caroline, lived on their own with her dad, Jacob Maswati, living in nearby Somerset West. Her dad was a farm worker and regularly visited his daughter. Caroline says her daughter was an active girl who enjoyed playing outside. She went to preschool during the week and would be starting school in the new year. To burn off some of her energy, Janita took dance classes from a man in the area called Denver Isaacs. Twenty-year-old Denver wasn't exactly a professional dancer himself, but he could certainly pull a few moves, and he offered the classes to the children in the area at an affordable price, he said, to give them something constructive to do with their time. Denver Isaacs was quite a good friend of Caroline and her family. His family were long-time residents in the area, and he often socialised with Caroline at parties. He worked peace jobs where he could, and on the days that he was off, he would offer to collect children from preschool if their parents were working. He'd often collected Janita from school, and the girl would wait with his family for a few hours until her mom came home, if she was working that day, to collect her. On Saturday the 25th of October 2009, Caroline Joseph says she and Janita woke around 8am, ate breakfast, and then Janita said she was going outside to play with her friends. This was pretty much normal for a Saturday, so Caroline thought nothing of it. She reminded Janita that her dad had said he was coming to pick her up later to take her to Somerset West for a few hours, and Janita said she would look out for him, and waved goodbye as she skipped out of the house. Around noon, 
Caroline went outside and saw that Janita wasn't playing with her group of friends anymore. She figured her dad must have picked her up. Their arrangements had been confirmed the night before. Caroline thought nothing more of it. Janita's dad didn't keep her overnight as the girl was very much a homebody and didn't like sleeping over at other people's houses. Later in the day, Caroline's friend Denver Isaacs paid her a visit. She noticed that he seemed to be acting strangely. He was chain-smoking and chewing on his fingernails, but Caroline was getting stuck into her housework and didn't pay him much attention, and Denver eventually left. As the hours ticked past and the sun started to set, Caroline became a little concerned that her daughter hadn't been returned yet. She didn't have her own phone, so she walked to a public phone and was eventually able to get hold of Janita's dad, who told Caroline that he'd had to work that day, so he hadn't picked Janita up. A cold shiver ran down the mother's spine. From there, she started walking between houses, calling out the girl's name. She went to the homes of the children she knew Janita had been playing with that day and found that those children had returned home and were washed and eating their dinners. No one had seen Janita. Caroline went home, hoping her daughter would be there, but she wasn't. Around 6.30pm, just as Caroline was starting to wonder whether she should get the community watch involved and arrange a search, her family friend Denver Isaacs arrived. The young man asked Caroline if Janita was home. Caroline figured he'd heard from one of the other neighbours that she was looking for her daughter and told Denver she wasn't and she was very worried. Then Denver said something quite strange. He said he'd been worrying about Janita all day because he'd seen her walking on the train tracks with her panties in her hand. He said he'd been on his way to an appointment so he hadn't stopped to check on her. Caroline was immediately horrified. Denver called a few people he knew that worked with the community watch and soon the woman's house was filled with concerned neighbours. He then asked Caroline for a picture of Janita and said he would go to the SAPS office in Somerset West to report her as missing. Around 7pm that night, Denver Isaacs walked into the SAPS in Somerset West. He spoke with Sergeant Jacob Sass and explained that he needed to report a child from the village missing. In the information he gave to Sass, he added something he hadn't told Caroline. He told the officer that he'd seen Janita earlier in the day and she was with a man called Denzel Raiters. Denzel Raiters was a 26-year-old resident of Sir Lowry's Pass village. The young man had a criminal record for housebreaking and assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. His family were also long-time residents of the village, but he'd come and gone as he spent time in prison and eventually ended up back at home a few months before. Sergeant Sass had a bad feeling about this, and he immediately informed the other officers he was going out to the village to assess the situation and would call in for reinforcements if required. He asked Isaacs to show him exactly where he'd last seen Janita Josephs, as that would undoubtedly be the best place to start. Isaacs agreed and directed Sass to a wooded area just outside the village. He said it was there that he'd last seen little Janita. And now he added some more detail. He said he'd actually witnessed Denzel Rater sexually assaulting Janita. Bizarrely, Isaacs claimed he'd called out and Raters had run away, so he'd carried on with his trip to Somerset West and when he got back, he'd gone to Caroline to make sure Janita had got home. Something was not fitting in the story for Sass, but his primary objective was finding the little girl. He called in additional backup, and a small search began of the area in the failing light. Officers also went to Denzel Rater's home, but the man wasn't there, and neither was Janita. 
Denzel's partner, with whom he had two children, told police she would let him know to come and see them the minute he returned. Despite Caroline's pleading for the search to continue until her daughter was safely home, close to 11pm, police had to call off the search for the night. It was simply becoming a futile exercise, and they would start up again first thing in the morning. And so, Caroline Josephs returned to her home alone, hoping that by some miracle, her daughter would return during the night. A few neighbours gathered with her to pray before they all returned to their homes. Denver Isaacs kneeled beside Caroline and held her hand as they prayed for Janita's safe return. Police at this point were keeping what Isaac had told them close to their chest. The community and Caroline knew that someone had pointed a finger at Denzel Raiders, but nothing more than that was shared at that point. Police were very aware that they had a smouldering ember in their hands. It's not uncommon for communities to take justice into their own hands, especially when a child is involved, and often broken telephone communication can mean either the wrong person is targeted or evidence is destroyed in the process. While the police had been in the village that night, a few people had already started coming forward with eyewitness accounts, and the evidence was now not pointing in Rater's direction, but rather toward the man who'd reported the child missing in the first place. A 14-year-old resident who knew both Denver Isaacs and Janita Josephs said they'd seen Janita walking with Isaacs up the dirt road that led to the N2 highway that morning. He'd called out to Janita and asked her where she was going, but she hadn't responded. Haley Perrin, a 19-year-old resident of the village, had also seen the child with Isaacs. They were holding hands and walking very quickly away from the village. Perrin had called out to Isaacs and asked him where he was taking the child, but he hadn't answered her. Haley's friend Janine had also witnessed something, and this began to stitch together the two stories that had been floated up until that point. Janine hadn't seen Janita, but she had seen Denver Isaacs at the entrance to the wooded area where he claimed he'd last seen her. And she also saw someone else she knew there. About four metres away from Isaacs stood Denzel Raiders. When the two men saw her, they'd begun walking away, slightly spaced apart, as though they were trying to seem like they weren't together. Janine knew Rate as well, their extended family members were married to each other, and the young woman didn't like the man at all, but that was no secret. When Rate spotted her still watching him, he spun around and demanded to know why she was looking at him. Janine said nothing, but she had a deeply uneasy feeling about the sighting. By daybreak the next day, Janita was still missing. Police were preparing to head out to the village to start the search again when Denzel Raters walked into the police station. He said he'd been out partying the night before, and when he returned home, he'd heard that police were looking for him. Warrant Officer James Robertson of the CID had been called in to assist in the investigation. He asked Raters about his movements the day before and asked whether he had seen Janita Joseph's. Raters said he wasn't sure who Janita was, but he had seen a young girl with Denver Isaacs the day before. Robertson asked Raters to accompany him back to the village. There, he requested that Isaacs come with him to the spot he'd pointed out the day before. At the edge of the wooded area, Raters and Isaacs came face to face and began to argue. Each man was accusing the other of being the last person seen with Janita Josephs. Robertson felt he had more than enough to arrest both men to figure out who was telling the truth, and he did just that. He asked a colleague to take Isaacs in their vehicle back to the police station, and he transported Raiders. 
As the villagers watched two of their residents led away in handcuffs, the smouldering ember of anger erupted. In the hours that followed, the officers that remained at the village had the unenviable job of trying to convince residents not to burn down the homes of Isaacs and Raiders. Raiders' partner and children fled and went to stay with family as crowds massed outside their home, baying for the type of justice they wanted to see. To their credit, along with the community watch members, police were able to convince the villagers that this type of behaviour was not in Janita's best interest. One way or another, they needed to find her. And until then, they needed everyone to cooperate and stay calm until they could figure out the truth. The truth would come in a single sentence, uttered by Denver Isaacs as he sat handcuffed in the back of a police car on the way to the station. Officer Yolandi Tabiertz had thought she'd try her luck at getting some information out of him while she drove and made eye contact with him in the rearview mirror. Is she alive or dead, Denver? Denver broke eye contact and looked out the window at the beautiful mountain scenery whizzing past. She's dead. I'll show you where her body is if you want. Tabiertz called the I.O., and told him that Isaacs wanted to point out Janita's body. And halfway to Somerset West, she turned the car around and headed back to the village. The I.O. instructed Tobias to bring Isaacs in through the back roads so that the villagers wouldn't know what was going on. If they were about to discover Janita's body, they didn't need a crowd of people trampling the scene. Isaacs would eventually take police deep into the wooded area, at least a kilometre from where he'd initially claimed he'd last seen Janita. Near a rubbish dump, he walked to a disturbed patch of earth and told police that that is where Denzel Reuters had buried Janita's body. Isaac's newly developed story would be that Denzel Reuters had forced him to participate in the rape and murder of seven-year-old Janita. He claimed Raiders had abducted Janita, then held him at knife point and forced him to rape her, and then Raiders had strangled the girl with her shoelace. Forensic technicians arrived to begin excavating the area Isaacs had pointed out. Janita was not buried very deep at all her body covered mainly in branches and piles of dead leaves. Please note that the following descriptions are extremely disturbing. The pathologist who would later perform an autopsy on the child would determine that she had died from ligature strangulation. Her shoelace was still tied around her neck. Her hyoid bone had been broken in the acts of strangulation. Janita had also sustained several other pre-mortem injuries, though. Blunt force trauma injuries covered her 1.2-metre, 23-kilogram body. Her chest, head, face, legs and back were bruised and swollen, and she had been raped both vaginally and anally. The young girl had sustained very serious internal injuries as a result of the rapes. As the devastating news was communicated to Caroline Josephs, the community once again erupted in rage. Police begged villagers to let them do their jobs, vowing to them that they would seek justice for them and Janita. Crowds watched from afar as the area was scoured for evidence, And finally, a van from the forensic pathology unit came to remove the child's body from the village she'd grown up in for the last time. Both Isaacs and Raiders continued to tell opposing stories, which changed and developed so frequently it was difficult to keep track. Raiders denied having any involvement in the rape and murder of Janita, 
but claimed he had seen Isaacs raping her, but hadn't done anything about it and had walked away. Although initially Isaacs admitted to raping Janita, soon he changed that claim to only having had simulated rape when raters had held him at knife point. This would soon be proven not to be true, though. Firstly, through the significant internal injuries Janita sustained, which certainly had not happened through a simulation. And secondly, through Isaac's own DNA. Swabs taken from the child identified Isaac's DNA in her anal area. His DNA was not found in her vagina, but the forensic techs could not exclude the possibility that there was a second man's DNA present there. The damage to the child unfortunately made swabbing and identifying foreign DNA a major challenge. With Raiders under arrest, several more witnesses came forward. Two men who'd been playing cards together on the morning of the 25th said that Raiders had arrived at their home that morning, appearing quite shaken up. He told them that he just saved a little girl from being raped. He claimed he'd been walking near the rubbish dump on the far end of the wooded area when he'd seen a man attempting to sexually assault a child. He had chased the man away and walked the little girl to a farm stall from where she said she could find her way home. The witnesses said they'd suggested that Rata should call the police and make sure the child was okay, but he shrugged it off and said he didn't want to get involved because of his criminal background and he was just glad he'd done a good deed. Both Denver Isaacs and Denzel Racers were charged with four different charges. The first was for the abduction of Janita Josephs. The second was for the vaginal rape. The third was for the anal rape. And the fourth was for her murder. Prior to 2007, when the new Sexual Offences Act was promulgated, Anal and oral rape were not seen as rape crimes, but rather indecent assault, which carries a far lower minimum sentence. Thankfully, this was corrected by the new SOA, and all non-consensual penetration or sexual acts are now considered to be an act of rape. In their first court appearance, both men pled not guilty to all the charges, and their plea explanations once again contained slightly different versions from the several they'd already given. Again, there are some disturbing descriptions here. Denver Isaacs claimed that he'd been at home on the morning of the 25th when Raters had come calling for 40 rand he owed him. He'd only been able to give him 20 rand, and Raters had told him to come with him. He wanted to show him something. When they rounded a corner, Isaacs claimed he'd seen Janita Josephs. Raters had led him and Janita into the wooded area. He believed that Raters had possibly sexually assaulted Janita before he joined them because he claimed he saw blood on the child's underwear. Then Isaacs said Raters had forced him to rape the child and after that Raters had removed one of her shoelaces fashioned it into a noose, slipped it around her neck, and started to strangle her. He claimed that the blunt force trauma wounds had come from Raiders standing on Janita during the rape, and also while he was strangling her. Isaacs claimed that he tried to stop Raiders from killing Janita, but the man had threatened him with a knife saying that Janita would be able to identify them, so she had to die. Isaac said he hadn't been able to do anything to help her. After Janita was dead, he claimed that Raiters had taken her body and buried her. Isaacs claimed that the witnesses who said they'd seen him with Janita were lying, and he'd played no role in abducting the child. As for why he hadn't reported Janita's rape and murder, and had instead seemingly intentionally thwarted attempts to find her body, he claimed that he was in a daze and frightened of raters. 
Denzel Reuters, on the other hand, stuck to his story about not having had anything to do with the rape and murder other than being an unintentional observer of the rape. He claimed that when Isaac saw him, he'd offered him 300 rand in exchange for his silence. He'd refused the money, though, and then Isaac had said that if he said anything, he'd put the blame on him. He claimed to have no knowledge of where and how Janita's body had been buried or hidden. And I'm sure you're not going to be surprised when I tell you that the two defendants had yet another version when they eventually testified in court. And Denzel Reuters was so adamant that he hadn't said certain things that a transcript of his bail hearing and his plea statement had to be handed to him so that he could refresh his memory. In this umpteenth version, Reuters said that he hadn't actually witnessed a rape. He'd only seen Isaacs first with Janita, and her panties had been removed, and then about 20 minutes later, he'd seen them again, and she was wearing no clothing from the waist down, and Isaacs was wiping with a cloth between her legs. Amazingly, Reuters said he didn't think anything strange about this. He also claimed that all the witnesses were lying, and of course, Isaacs was too. As for his story about rescuing a girl from sexual assault that he told to his card-playing friends, he claimed he just made that story up to make himself look like a hero. Reuters presented his evidence in a very specific way. When he was talking about things that were not incriminating, he would have lots of detail to share and seemed to have a brilliant memory. Then, when it came to parts of the story that could incriminate him, he suddenly had memory loss from long-term drug use and could remember very little. The state's version of events was as follows. They believed that Denver Isaacs, who knew Janita very well from being friends with her mom, collecting the child from preschool occasionally, and giving her dance classes, had been the one to lure the child away from her home and abduct her. Janita did not know Denzel Reuters at all, and there's very little chance that she would willingly have gone with him. Isaacs, on the other hand, seemed safe. Then he'd taken the child into the wooded area where Reuters was waiting. The prosecution believed both men had conspired to abduct, rape, and kill Janita. The state said that after abducting her, both men had likely raped the child, and then both had been party to her strangling. All of the witnesses testified, as well as the police officers, forensic pathologist, and lab technicians who'd done the DNA comparisons. Reuters' partner testified too, but she ended up only telling the court what they already knew, and that related to his whereabouts after the period during which the murder had taken place. Finally, in May 2010, the judge began to deliver his verdict. He determined that the eyewitnesses who had seen both Isaacs with Janita and Isaacs with Raiders the day before had no reason to lie, and therefore their evidence could be accepted as true. Finally, in May 2010, the judge began to deliver his verdict. He determined that the eyewitnesses who had seen both Isaacs with Janita and Isaacs with Raiders that day had no reason to lie, and therefore their evidence could be accepted as true. He also determined that it was far more likely that Janita would have gone with Isaacs than with Reuters, and so he believed that Isaacs had lured the girl away. He did note, though, that he felt Reuters had been complicit in the entire event, so as a result, he too was guilty of abduction because he had been aware of it and waiting on the other end to receive the captive. As for the rapes, the judge found that the physical evidence showed Isaacs had undoubtedly raped Janita anally. However, he had to consider that Raiders, despite his DNA not being present, 
must have wanted to abduct Janita for some of his own personal gain too, and certainly not just to watch Isaacs rape her. So the judge believed that Raiders was guilty of the vaginal rape. The judge found Isaac's version of having been held at bay from saving Janita from death by Raiders was ridiculous. He described a scene where Raiders would have had to have had time to loosen the child's shoelace, fashion it into a noose, wrap it around her neck, then balance on one leg while holding the child down with his other foot, strangle her with one hand and simultaneously wield the knife with the other hand to stop Isaacs from thwarting the murder. And if there was a knife present, why would they have resorted to strangulation? Clearly, this was humanly impossible. So the judge decided Isaacs must have been complicit in the murder and agreed to it. Whether or not he actually did the strangling didn't really matter from a legal perspective. The men had acted with shared intent, and therefore were both guilty of murder. Denver Isaacs was found guilty of three of the four charges, namely abduction, anal rape, and murder. And Denzel Raiters was found guilty of abduction, vaginal rape, and murder. From there, the judge ordered that psychiatric assessments be carried out to determine whether there were aggravating or mitigating circumstances involved, such as serious mental illness, personality disorders, which may result in a reduced possibility for rehabilitation, or intelligence issues. The men's backgrounds were also to be looked into by a social worker who would also assess the impact on Janita's family and her community. This process would take another full year, and on the 4th of May 2011, three days after Janita Josephs would have turned nine years old, her rapists and murderers were handed down two life sentences each for their crimes. Despite the ridiculous stories that these two offenders tried to come up with, their lies could not stand up to the evidence. It is actually very likely, given Isaac's history with Janita's family, that he'd been grooming the child and perhaps even abusing her to some extent before the day he abducted her. The fact that he placed himself in a position where he helped to care for and interact with other children in the community horrifies me, as he was very clearly a pedophilic sexual predator, and I am 100% certain this was not his first victim. Denzel Raiters had his own young children, very similar in ages to Janita, and that is a terrifying thought too. Both men very clearly participated in this atrocious crime willingly, and likely even planned it well in advance. We so often see offenders inserting themselves into investigations, but Isaacs really went beyond what many do. I'm not sure how he thought he was going to get away with the crime, but perhaps that's all part of how people like him think. They think they're smarter than everyone else. And really, he had been fooling people for a long time. He'd hidden in plain sight, the veritable wolf in sheep's clothing. He'd ingratiated himself into the community in a position of trust. And then abused that trust in the most horrific way. Stranger danger is a fallacy we need to stop pretending is helpful. Yes, strangers can be dangerous. Raiders proved that. But if it hadn't been for the smiling, familiar face of Isaacs and the sense of safety he represented, it's unlikely Janita would have been lured away. I don't do child cases very often. And as I've said in other episodes, I usually try not to picture what the words on the page are actually saying. 
But I will admit, when I was describing the blunt force trauma injuries to Janita's tiny body and how they seemed to have been sustained by Rater's standing on her, my brain formed the image. And you almost didn't get an episode. I have learned that not all offenders are cut from the same cloth. I have now personally met and engaged with people who have committed violent crimes in their past and are now rehabilitated and contributing to society. But I've also learned to distinguish between the types of offenders where that is a possibility and where it is not. Raters and Isaacs fall into the not category. Any grown person who can do that to a seven-year-old child does not deserve to ever see the light of day again. It revolts me and disgusts me to the core of my being. But more than anything, I feel so, so sorry for Janita. But sadly, my feeling bad does absolutely nothing to help. But at least now, you know that for seven years back in the early 2000s, there was a little girl that lived in Sir Lowry's past village. There are no pictures of her that I could find, but her name was Janita. She enjoyed playing with her friends. She loved dancing. She loved her mom and dad. And her life was ended far too soon. And we can't change that. But you can, maybe, spend five minutes at the end of this episode picturing her playing in the sandy streets of the village, laughing, smiling, kicking a ball, running down the dirt road in a race with her friends. And at least, she'll live on for those five minutes. Janita Josephs, rest gently. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, Please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.